Right, we are sharing on the law. Or let's put it differently. The ten principles by which God governs society. Whether we are ignorant of it, God still governs society by the ten principles. Whether we um, reject it, is it, it's irrelevant. Society and man is governed, are governed by specific principles. And the sooner and the quicker we realize it, the more we can work and identify it and work along with the principles that God has set. There are pathways that God has set, which is important in all relationships. Our relationship with God and our relationship with man. That's what the Ten Commandments talk about. First of all, our relationship towards God. And secondly, what our relationship we should be towards man. And God gives us specific indications, landmarks, road signs. Whatever way you want to mention or whatever way you want to call them. And that is very important. So it gaan nie oor die wette nie, die geboeie nie. Die wette en die geboeie is nie reels nie. Want dan praat ons weer van legalism. Dan praat ons weer van wettisisme waarvan die Heere ons verlos het. So ons praat nie van om na die beginsels te kyk of na die geboeie te kyk as reels nie. So, since the Lord has saved us, we do not look at the laws and the commandments and the precepts as rules. Because that brings bondage. And it brings death. And it brings a curse. We see them in the spirit in which God has given them. Even according to the ancient Hebrew lexicons, they specifically specify, they specify and say, the commandments and the laws and the precepts are not rules. They are there for landmarks, for indicators, the same as uh, landmarks are for any traveler in the olden days. When they traveled by animals, they had specific uh, landmarks by which they would uh, know their way so that they can get to specific uh, uh, pastures and water and, and, and shelters and so on on their way. Naai selle licht moet ons die reels, ach die, die wette, die geboeie moet ons na kyk. So what is important, and that was a, a, a big a turn point in my life when I realized God is the lawgiver. God has made certain laws. He's made Laws for nature, by which nature operates, which is phenomenal. As ons kyk na die wette wat die Heere gestel het, hoe om die natuurlijke wereld te regeer, is het ongelooflik. That's why you and I can be very certain that the sun today, if the law doesn't come today, the sun will set in the west. Will not set, set somewhere, somewhere. It's going to set in the west. God has got a specific pathway that he, is, that he has set aside for the sun to walk or the sun to run, as the Bible says. The sun cannot do what he wants. He has to follow the commandment that has been given him. If the sun should decide to follow any other way, there will be disaster and death in this universe, in our little universe. The same with us. God has set specific pathways that we must follow in our relationship with Him. And God has specific pathways in which we have to follow and, and re, uh, have relationship with one another. Those pathways are set. So that is very important. So there's natural laws and there's spiritual laws. We are learning about the spiritual laws when we study the Ten Principles. And pleading ignorance is not excused. Pleading ignorance 
in uh, and, and asking excuse for not obeying and not following natural laws. The only thing that will happen with you is that you will experience a curse. You will be destroyed or hurt by not following the natural law. If you do not believe in the law of gravity, and you climb on this roof, and your faith is big and strong, as the church world many times say, and you walk, and you walk past the roof, or whatever, you walk too far, you're going to fall at a specific speed towards the earth. Even that is specified, at what speed you will hit the earth. With your mass, and acceleration, and gravity as the important principles. The same in our spiritual and our natural relationships with man. God expects a specific way how we should deal with us or with ourselves in our relation towards Him and towards one another. If we ignore them, or if we plead ignorance, you get divorces, you get unhappy people, you get uh, 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 people with stress, you get people committing suicide, you get murders, you get uh, adulteries, you get different sicknesses of this world, which is actually just the result of ignoring specific spiritual principles and pathways and landmarks that the Lord has set there. It's actually very simple to understand. So the better and the more we learn the, sp the specifications around the principle, the better for us. If you would take the constant for gravity, now we have a few scientists here, Heinrich and Ansi and Claudio. They work, they work according to specific constants in the natural world. Claudio, if you would ignore the decimals in specific constants, what will be the effect in your project? A disaster comes. Even if you ignorantly disobeys or changes certain specifics. Yes. So that is why it's so important to study the Word of God so that we can know the specifics and understand why we get certain results which are devastating or hurtful in our relationship with Him. Can you say amen? So there are certain consequences if we ignore certain principles. And once again, I'm saying, we're not talking about legalistically about them. God has never cast away the law and the commandments. Never, ever, ever. Because God cannot be separated from His Word. God is His Word and His Word is God. We cannot separate the law and the principles and the precepts and the commandments from God. God is God. But what we must do is we are governed by a relationship and in and, in and from that relationship we, we acknowledge that there are certain principles, and we gladly follow the principles, because in any relationship there are codes of conduct. And it teaches us what are the codes of conduct in our relationship with God and with one another. So they are indicators, very important indicators. The same as if you would want to go to Cape Town to watch the rugby. By faith, as they call it many times, you will not get in your car and just travel by faith as you feel. As you feel that you should travel. Maybe you, you, you climb your car, uh, maybe I climb in my car and I, and I sit and I say, by faith, I feel or I really believe that I'm on my way to Cape Town, but I'm going to take the Whitbank Road. And I'm going to follow the way to Sabi. And then I will get Cape Town. So when I stop at Sabi and they tell me Cape Town is very further than when you've started, I mustn't be surprised. 
and angry. Like we as Christians many times do. By faith we do certain things and we say that it's God's landmarks and God's pathways that we take. And the result is you end at Sabi instead of Cape Town and you say, but you followed the rules, you followed the pathway, you followed the landmarks, you followed God's principles. So that's why we've brought in a little bit of, of knowledge, a little bit of insight with the letters of the alphabet so we can make sure that when we read the, the, the road map, which is God's word, which is God's principles, which is God's commandments and law, when we read it, that we definitely interpret the road map correctly. Not just as we feel and as we believe, but that our faith is specifically grounded on specific indicators and specific landmarks and specific road signs. Right, just to give you an example, uh, when, the, when the commandments talk about uh, remember the Sabbath, and we won't get there today, we'll get there late, uh, next week or the, the week after. Remember the Sabbath. Don't forget the Sabbath. Why does it, is it because the Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath is a rule? No. He says, remember there's a rest that the Sabbath actually refers to. There's a rest uh, that you and I need to enter. What's a rest praat hy van? He talks about a rest, a dependence, an absolute dependence upon God's sovereignty. And that God is in control in your life. Even though things may seem to be scrambled and out of control. It's just out of your control. Now let me turn with you to 1 John chapter 2. And we're just going to read it in remembrance before we turn back to the Old Testament. Let's just turn to 1 John. The letters of John, just before you get the book of Revelations. 1 John chapter 2. It's the letters of John, not the gospel of John. <laughs> So it's 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, no, let's, let's read there from verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. It is the New Testament, it's the Apostle John talking to the church about 90 after Christ, the church were in a terrible condition at that time, and he was setting specific uh, landmarks, specific principles. He was repeating them. And he says, if you say that you know me, if you, if you say that you know him, you must keep his commandments. Verse 4, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Is that very clear? So, that's why we are studying the commandments. And he says here, keep the commandments. Hou die geboeie, sê die ouwe Afrikaanse Bijbel. Dit beteken nie, jy moet sêkere reels gehoorsam nie. Wat is hou die geboeie beteken? What does keep the commandments mean? That word keep is the word shomar. It means embrace, cherish, hold dear to you the principles that he has laid down. So I say, koester die beginsels wat die Heer in sy woord hou, uh, gee, koester hulle na. Maar ek kan alleen ek sy beginsels koester if I know what is his commandments. And I do not trust people. How many times and how often people have said, but the word of God says this and this. 
Or doesn't the word of God say, say this or this? Then usually I need to say, I usually I say, no, it doesn't exactly say as you're saying. If I, if I follow the way that you are saying, I'm going to get lost. Even in my ignorance, by following what you say, God's word says, I might get a result which will not be pleasing. And I will end where I didn't think I will end. So here the Apostle John reminds them, in the New Testament, say, Ondou jylle met die beginsels van die evangelie, die beginsels van die woord en die gebruik, specifiek die woord geboeie, hy sê jylle met die geboeie weet wat die geboeie is, wat die beginsels is, hy sê, en dan moet jylle daar die beginsels na by jylle hou, en jylle moet het koester. Nee, if I tell you that I, I cherish my wife, but I stay at a different place, and I see her now and then, and most of the time I just SMS to her or WhatsApp to her, and I speak to her over the phone now and then, I never, never really get close to her personally, we never have intimacy, will I then uh, convince you that, we, that I uh, cherish her? No ways. If I tell you that I cherish my wife, you will see me constantly with her. You will see me and uh, see me see me and her in my conversations constantly or regularly. You will see us having special appointments, arranged appointments. And by watching me, you will see, yes, he does cherish her. Yes, she is important to him. Yes, they do have a relationship. So you cannot tell anybody that you do keep the commandments if you never study the Word, read the Word, share the Word, embrace the Word, allow the Word to rule your thinking, rule the different emotions in your heart, rule you in your situations, so that needs to be visible. And that's why the Lord has given us the ten principles. He calls them uh, in some Hebrew, in some Hebrew uh, uh, teachings, they talk about the ten words. Ten words that you and I need to learn and remember because our important landmarks. The ten words I shared with you last week. Here is a opsomming van die ten geboeie, wat eindig ten woorde is. First of all, God reminds us, and we're going uh, to read uh, some of it just now. God reminds us, and God starts there in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2 to verse 17. First of all, God reminds us, He is sovereign. I am. I've worked for many years with criminals. I've worked with murderers. People that has really murdered other people. I've worked with bank robbers. I've worked with people that uh, could for false. Fraud in fraud. And the way I work with them, when I meet them the first time, I don't ask them, did you do this or did you do that? I ask them, why did you do it? It puts them immediately in a different position. Because now we're not going to argue, if you did, did you do it, did you? No, I didn't do it. You see, it isn't me, it is that. And, oh, 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 oh. No. Since you've done it, let's, let's start there. Since you have done it, let's talk from there. God says, I am. God doesn't say, I don't want to argue with you. It's not a point of, do I exist or don't I exist? Where do I exist? How do I look? Uh, am I or am I not? He says, I am. So let's start there. I am. Okay. Which is, which is wonderful to me. Many times in my own mind, I'm like you and you like me. You start thinking, is God, is he not, is he not? And then when you read the word, it says, I am. 
Yud Hei Vo Hei means I exist. That's it. I exist. So let's start from there. Because that is a very reasonable and a very intellectual way to start. Did you see the sunrise? Did you see that he's, he rises and he, and, he, and he goes down by certain rules, certain pathways? Did you have a look that the season is changing and has been changing? Did you know, and I'm very excited because I'm a seed man, I like seeds. I said to my wife, June is usually a quiet month in nature. Quiet. Everything quiets down. I said to her, we're getting close to July. Then I personally walk to the trees and I look at the signs of new life. And I say to her, because we eat from our vegetable garden, I say to her, things are going to stand still in the vegetable garden in June. So I must, I must plant things such that the things will be ready when June comes. Because June, everything stands still. But when July comes, you can hear you can hear the motion because God has put principles there and everything works according to the principles. Seasons. 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 Growth cycles. Growth cycles. What is the growth cycles about? The growth cycles is about God putting you aside for Himself. The Heere vat jou na omstandighere toe Waar jy elke keer moet besluit, wil ek een kant wees vir die heren. Gaan ek my gedagtes, my gevoelens, my emoties, my woedes, en alles, gaan ek het, gaan ek het voor die heren een kant sit. Gaan ek myself een kant sit, of gaan ek word soos die rest van die wereld. Gaan ek in die situasie optroe, optree soos die rest van die wereld. Of wil ek, he, die heren moet my in die situasie ook een kant sit, dat ek anderste is, en hoe ek die situasie hanteer. Can you understand that in English? Okay. God puts you in different circumstances every time because He wants to see, are you going to separate yourself from how the rest of the world deals with, uh, with themselves in this situation? So you determine whether you are set aside or not. And without being set aside, you will not see God. That's what Scripture says. So while we sit here, we are learning how to set ourselves aside for Him only. He doesn't want to share you with anybody else. So the first word that we must remember is sovereignty. The second word that we must learn from the ten principles, the law in Exodus chapter 20 is God doesn't want any idolatry. We're going to have a look at it today. God hates Idolatry. God wants, doesn't want us to use His name in vain. And we do. We're going to study that still. To say, how do I use the Lord's name in vain? Who gebrek ek die Heere sy naam eindelijk? Die kerkwereld dreun. De dreun. Van hoe die kerkwereld ons baie keer die Heere sy naam eindelijk gebruik. Ons dink hy is ons kiwi. Weet jylle wat is a skiwi? We think God is our, what is the skiwi, what is skiwi in English? Yeah, but a skiwi is more of a little man that you shunt around. One that polishes your shoes, one that you, he washes the dishes and. Yeah, what? Yeah. That's a skiwi. Yeah, so we many times think God is our skivvy, our subordinate, our, that we need to shunt him down. The, he doesn't know. We tell him if we have a problem, we tell him how he is going to solve this problem. Because he's an idiot. According to the ways that we deal with him. So it's using his name in vain. Then we're going to learn, and God says, there's a rest. There's a rest. In Hebrews chapter 4, God says, and the Hebrew writer says there, which is Paul, he says to the Christians, he says, most of you haven't entered into the rest. 
And those in Israel who didn't enter into the rest died in the wilderness. The wilderness is full of corpses of Christians. What is the wilderness? What does the word wilderness mean? What betekent the word wilderness? The woestijn. What betekent the word woestijn that Israel must trek? It means the place of testings and trials. It's where you and I find out how much we have grown. And we are so annoyed when we find ourselves being so childish. And we get angry with God, which a child does. Angry. When you are not where you're supposed to be. And you blame Him for it. And you blame those around you for it. Okay, so there's a rest. And then He says, honor the father and mother, which is honor authority that God has placed there. Even the government. Because the government didn't just come there. Because certain people, and because us as a nation, and because us as a people in Southern Africa, didn't follow the principles of God's kingdom. We have the result that we do have. Whether we like to hear it or not, that's the truth. And then he says, there's all types of murder. There's all types of adultery. There's all types of theft. All types of false uh, testimony. Giving false testimony. And all types of covenant. Uh, being uh, covetous. And last week we've shared and I sh uh, told you that how they affect one another. I've, I've drawn it down. I've drawn it here. I cannot repeat what I've did last week. But what I do want to remind you and you will see it in my, in my Hebrew Bible and even in my complete Jewish uh, Bible. It will show you. There's not a one standing there. It is... Let me just take another color. I've got so many colors here. I'm very excited. That you will find in the Jewish Bible. Number one, talks about Aleph. Number two, talks about Beth. What is your home? What should be in your home? Thirdly, he talks about Gimel. What does Gimel talk about? What pathways do you take? Do you to, to take the pathway of the Holy Ghost? That is the voice in the wilderness crying? Then the fourth one that talks about rest will tell you about Dalet. The fifth one will talk to you about Hey, the sixth one will talk to you about Va. The seventh one, which is adultery, will speak to you about Shin. The eighth one will reveal to you how we jump the fence, the Chet. The eighth one talks to us about death. And the tenth one, of course, talks to us about the youth. Do you get a glimpse of how intricate interdependent, interrelated the word of God is. Ek probeer vir u hier visueel wees hoe absolute, how geniusly, if I may use that simple word to explain God's mind, which is 
impossible. But let me just show you. So what does this imply? It implies that these principles are interrelated. If you have a problem with this one, it is because of the other principles preceding it that wasn't followed. The landmarks were not obeyed. And one precedes the other and follows the other. Did you want to say something? Say. Come closer, let me just put it on the video. Yes. We call them Abjad, Abbas, or Tsar. Abjad, Abbas, or Tsar. Exactly. The commandment. Yeah. Yes. Of course, the people that use it in my country don't know it because they are not Christians. Mm. But we just know it. All right. My mother is a practicing Muslim, but she knows the Abjad, Abbas, or Tsar alphabet. Mm. But now we know what it is in real fashion. Yes. All right. Okay. So let me try and show you what. Here is a, a diagram. So it's the mother board. After a rekenaar. It's like the mother board. Of a, of a computer that you are looking at. Just a simple diagram of what the interrelationship of what God has said here, which is a composition of what it is to serve God, because we've learned last week, we said that these first five principles that we see here is uh, how uh, our duty, duty towards God or what the components of our relationship with God uh, entails. And we've learned that these five talks about our interrelationship between man. What are the principles that make a relationship between man and man work? And as we said, you say, but I'm not a thief. I'm not an adulterer. Don't be too quick to say that because we're going to study what God has been saying. It involves you and it involves me whether you have stolen something physically or whether you've killed something physically or not. It involves us all. Alright. So let's just have a look here. When we talk about murder we said it is the letter Va. And Vaugh talks about, if we can summarize it, Vaugh talks about uh, the man of the word. And here we can now see how a man of the word, what, is, what precedes a person to become them a man of the word. You see, what precedes. What precedes. You and me to become a man or a woman of the word. So a man of the word. To become a man of the word. Or let's put it uh, in a negative way. We murder the truth. Oh, because we murder the truth. We do not see him as the sovereign one. Because it's about me. We think life is about you. Life is not about you. Life is not about Charlie. Life is not about John Hendricks. Life is not about Afshin. Life is not about Claudio. Life is not about you and me. Your relationship with the people that is dear in your life is not the primary thing. It's not about you in that relationship. Although, many times we pick up trouble. Why? Because... You and I think that the relationship that you have with your wife or with whoever is about you. You think that's why there's a relationship. It's about you. It's not about you. 
It's not about me. It's about God and you. So, put it the other way around. As I said, this is a wonderful diagram. Put it the other way around. Because I do not see God's sovereignty, I kill and murder the truth. In circumstances. In situations. And therefore, because of that, I am not a pillar. And you can keep on going to, uh, to and fro just with this one's principle. I've written you many things. Let me just get, get there. So if you think that your human relations, as I said, this side talks about relationship among men. This talks about relationship with man, with God. The one affects the other. We cannot have a wonderful relationship with God and a terrible relationship with man because they are interconnected. So, many times I've heard about the Christian leaders. But it is not a pleasure to be on the way, to be able to be. Because they are so geestelijk. I don't know how to speak. Don't speak rubbish. If, if you and because you have got such a wonderful relationship with God, it must absolutely be reflected in our relationship with man. And husband, because you are the man of the word, the man of the word, your wife must experience your relationship with God through you. And vice versa. In that way, there will be harmony in the house. Because you are following, and I'm following, landmarks that God has set there that involves blessings. I can myself and my auntie can now hold them all in my I can only hold them all for me. But as I go back, as I can remember, if I can remind you about last week, last week, remember, God had the nation of Israel stand in front of him between two mountains. The one mountain is called blessing and the other mountain is called curse. Literally. And God said to them, now, I'm asking you to choose. Do you want to follow my commandments and my law and my principles? If you do, you will experience blessing. God doesn't bring the blessing then from somewhere. Because you are following the principles of God, you are blessed. Following the principles of God blesses. Or if you do not follow the principle of God or the principles of God in your relationship, you will experience a curse. God doesn't then curse you and it comes from somewhere. Because you are not following the principle in that situation, in that condition, because you are not following, you experience and I experience a curse. It's very simple. Uh, therefore, life and getting you, your and my needs met. Life is not about let me correct myself. Life is not about you and me getting our needs met. Life is more than that. Life is this. Life is not of what you can get out of it. Marriage is not what you can get out of it. Any relationship down here on this earth is not what you can get out of it. Okay. This is life. Life is a blessing. Which is a result of walking in the spirit 
or let me put it other way. Life is a result of following the principles of the kingdom in my relationship with him, which is a blessing. Life can be a curse if you and I, in whatever situation, do not follow the principles that he has set down. Or maybe you think that you are following his principles, but when you really go down to the, to the uh, drawing board, you see that you have followed your own principles, and therefore you are experiencing a curse. Or the fruit of the, of the flesh. So the fruit of the flesh is the curse. The fruit of the Spirit is the blessing. I was so thousand of good like that I have seen us that I can't, on the evidence, I hope I can't, not say. Let's just read here in Galatians. Let's just turn to Galatians. Ons het hier een muurnis wat ons oopkrap van inlichting en begrip. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. If you read Paul's writings, you would see, you will identify that the, what, what do you call that plate in the old times when they printed something? Templin, templin, no. Nah. Templin. What, what do you call that plate in the old printing methods that they set with a, with a, with a metal? Uh, they set. Uh, a printing plate. Right. If you read Paul's uh, writings, you would see that he writes with this as the template, the background when he writes to the Christian church. He just makes it very practical. Let's just read here. But if you, sorry, it's, one, uh, it's Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. If ye be led of the Spirit, all right, just stay with me. Don't keep many further listening. If you be led by the Spirit, what would you do? Have a look here. If you be led by the Spirit of God, you would obey and follow and keep and cherish the principles that he has laid down for your relationship with him and for the relationship with, with man. If you do that, you are following the leading of the Spirit. Ye are not under the law. Yes, you are following the principles of the law, not as rules, but as landmarks. You are not under the law. Now, <clears throat> the works of the flesh is manifest, which are these, he says. So if you ignore the principles, because you do find Christians, of course, which they are just led by the Spirit. They are led by the Spirit. They do not believe in the Old Testament. They, I wonder whether they believe in the New Testament, because they seldom read and really study that. But they, just, they are just led by the Spirit, they say. The Word says, what Spirit? Because if you are led by the Spirit, the Spirit will lead you back to the Word of God. And as I've read to you what the Apostle John says, it will lead you back to the commandments. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh is manifest. Which are these? So he says, if you do not follow these principles, dear ones, Paul says, this is how the manifestation of not following it will be. Adultery, do you identify adultery here? Fornication, do you uh, identify there among adultery? Uncleanness, do you see? 
lasciviousness, idolatry, you see it, witchcraft, rebellion is the son of witchcraft, we will get there, rebellion is witchcraft, rebelling against what? Uh, rebelling against the truth that God has set down. Rebelling against the landmarks that God said that you must follow. Hatred. Murder. Hatred is murder. Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. And as we study, we're going to study these uh, in not too much detail, but in a little bit of detail, then you will see all that Paul has written there, which is the effect of not following God's commandments. The effect is that you walk in the flesh and that you experience His curse. Then he says here, uh, if which I tell you before, verse 21, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All right? Because, as I said, if I by faith get in my car, I want to, my, end, my, my destination is Cape Town, but I climb in the car and I refuse to use the map. But I go according to my feeling, and my, which I call faith. And I end up in Sabi. I am not. I've missed the kingdom. I've missed Cape Town. Even though I had Cape Town in my mind all the time and I was driving. Follow the map. Of why, how do we put it these days? You follow the GPS, donkey. Yeah. You start le learning to read my lips or my face. I don't know what. But if you can help me with my language, it will be fantastic. All right. The GPS. It means walking in the Spirit. The Spirit of God is the GPS. Right. So he says there. But, verse 22... The fruit of the Spirit, so he says. The obedience to the principles and the landmarks of God. If you direct your life, your relationship with Him, according to the commandments, and your relationship with man, according to the commandments, uh, out of a relationship with Him, he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law, All right, we can continue reading that. So before we go into detail, let me just quickly go over here so you can have an overall picture of what the principles are that we have here. Okay. Jesus said, when he spoke to the Pharisees, he said to them, you've learned, and you've heard, that a man is not to commit adultery. Of course, everybody says, yes, no adultery. And he says to them, you are all adulterers. Because the law is about the heart. Not about the action, but the motive. And what goes on in the heart. That is why this has been written. Not only to stop the outward, because when you get to the outward, it had had a long History of development in your heart and in your mind. Okay. So when we talk about adultery, we see there that it is the Zayan, truth. If you and I do not embrace the truth, you will embrace some other lover. Definitely. Which is usually I. Okay. We will embrace some other lover and 
By doing that, we commit idolatry because the word idolatry comes from the word idea. The root word of the word idolatry is idea. So what we find in the Christian world is people and us, you and me, many times follow our own ideas when we get into trouble, into circumstances that we would like to get out of. We have our own ideas and our own plans, and we call them God's plan and God's idea. Because that way, that way we, san we sanction, or that way we get the rubber stamp, by saying it's God's I idea or God's plan. And meanwhile, we are committing adultery. So the idolatry and adultery are twin sisters. We cannot separate the one from the other. When somebody does adultery on the outward, he has already committed long time idolatry and has ignored God's sovereignty in the whole process. And has murdered the truth. Right. Many times we use his name in vain. We abuse his name. We use his name, but we're actually stealing glory from God. Because we do not keep within the boundaries and the fence of truth. Because this fence of truth that the Lord gives us is, for, first of all, for self and for myself to be safe and to keep myself with God, with the truth, to walk in the Spirit, so that I do not jump over the fence or run through the fence whenever I want to. But God has got a way to let me know that I've broken the fence. So I need the fence. What does the text speak about? The text speaks about, and here we, if we look here at the Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, uh, letter, we see it, as we said many times, the flesh inside of you, the religious man inside of you, because we are all religious. Man is religious. Whether he's a heathen, a viking, a bushman, or somebody from Cape Town, or Gauteng, man always and will ever be religious serving something and bowing to some king, some ruler, whether it's himself or whatever. So, if I bow to self in whatever situation or condition, I miss the rest that he has for me. And we're talking about Christians. How often have you been disquieted, stressed, all of us, stressed, because we were bowing not to the Zion truth, which is Zion, to the Zion truth, was not bowing to the truth, which is Jesus Christ himself. I didn't bow my religious self, my flesh, self, the old man, I didn't bow it in adoration to the truth. I bowed uh, myself before self or any other ideology or anybody else's idea or my own plan, which I called God's plan many times, which, is, which had been my plan. And then I do not get to the place of rest. I do not find a Sabbath. Where does covetousness come from? Covetousness comes from when I reach out my hand to, 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 to fulfill my own need, my own greed, my own mind, what I think I need, and therefore not honoring what God has dealt and given you at this stage in life. We dishonor. We do not respect what He has given me. I'm unhappy because I'm coveting... Uh, coveting uh, co I'm um, coveting, 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 
定定，你静静的 ，coveting， <笑> coveting， because I've been coveting and having my own hand in this. That was no glei glei. Can you say my story is about any glei glei? Where it net it's it. I go there. You must get an idea. Cry. You must get a glimpse of the intricate. It's a Lego, more than a Lego. It is the motherboard of society and of this life that you look at. That speaks about you, and speaks about me. Ah. So let's start, and 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 start and look at more detail. The interrelationship between. The the ten words, the ten commandments. When the Lord says to Israel, and when He says to you and me, "I am the Lord thy God that has delivered you from the house of bondage, from Egypt and the slave house of slavery," who of you have been released and and set free from the house of slavery, the slavery of sin? Being absolutely under the government of the principles of this earth, when your fallen nature said, "Be angry," we were angry. We didn't have any control. When you say, "When you your flesh is just an archon," then you see, "Can we not go out with it? We did it." Gevreek het. Want jou natuur gesê het, dis nie reg nie, jy verdien meer, jy verdien beter, dan het jy op een sekere manier dit reageer en opgetree. So remember, the Lord says, you have been delivered from the house of slavery and bondage. You are not the slave of sin anymore. I am Have delivered you and me. I am. You can use this as a template for your prayer, for prayer, as uh, for a raamwerk om om te bid. As you know, verstaan waar we dit gaan, kan dit vir jou duidelike raamwerk hier van hoe jy kan bid. Wanneer ons bid. Wanneer ons dink, wanneer ons lewe, wat ons vergeet, ach, wat ons nooit vergeet nie, hy is, he is, a left, he is the source, he is the beginning of the situation that you are in. And always react with gratefulness. Because you are not the God of this world. You are not the God in the house that you are living. It's not about you in the marriage that you are that you are that you have the relationship that you have. Let us have a look at. He says, "Thou shalt not kill." The right word is actually murder. You are not allowed to murder because there is a time to kill. There is a time to kill. That's a different study. Because this life stands on three pillars. Three pillars. The word teaches. Stands on justice. Mercy. Yud Hay Vah Hay speaks about that. Yud Hay talks about talks about justice, which is judgment. And Vah Hay talks about mercy. If you would study it, so life does definitely consist out of justice. And mercy, 
but it's two principles that you cannot bring together. It's impossible. Only by truth. So if you study Hebrew, you will see truth is the balancing principle that brings justice and mercy together. Truth only can say, now certain principles of justice needs to be followed, and only so much, and so much mercy is to be followed, and so much. Right. So, you and I murder the truth many times. Because sovereignty, Aleph, Hyute Vorte, is the truth, is emet. So, in whatever you or I or the church world or religion kills truth. The result will be a curse. The result is curse. The result is walking in the flesh, which eventually results in not inheriting the kingdom. So how long are you going to kill the truth in that area in your life where the Lord is busy with you? How do we kill the truth? By hating it. Have you found yourself, as I have found myself, there were times and there are times in my life where I hated the truth. Shall I have to say that I have not known what I have known? Because I have to believe it. Okay. So, how do we hate the truth? By ignoring it. We hate the truth by ignoring it. They say one of the cruelest things to do to a man is by ignoring him completely. There's experiments that they've done where they gave negative attention to somebody and whether they've plainly just uh, told to some uh, to, uh, people, I hate you, and where they ignored them. And the results they have found, the worst is ignoring. <coughs> what does Christians do? They just give the word of God and ignore. They ignore the word of God. You say, but the word says this. They ignore it. Because now, in this situation, it doesn't suit us or suit them or suit you or suit me to recognize the truth. So we are killing it. He says, thou shalt not kill. Choose this day. Whether you want a blessing or a curse. When we ignore the truth, it goes along with the curse. You experience the curse. Have you tasted it in your mouth? When you are killing the truth, you can taste it. Do you know what I'm talking about? You don't feel too well. And you blame it on anything else. But what God's Spirit is saying, don't kill the truth. Irritableness is another form of murder. To be irritable. How many times I've been irritable with my wife? Have I ever been? I told her when I ask you that question, don't go, just go a little bit. How I many have you been irritable with? Sadly. <laughs> Claudia, have you been irritable with your boss? 
<laughs> we're, we're all guilty. We're all guilty. We're all guilty. If you remain being irritable, you are, uh, remain following and choosing the curse that goes along with it. If you want the blessing, repent of it. My way, walking my way, walking to my wife has been very well trampled. It's a deep road. That's a good uitgetrapte highway naar my vrou toe. Yes, so gee, it's so jammer. I was irritated with your gebeurs. It's jammer. She doesn't know what went on before that, before that confession. Because here, in my study, I mean, I'm studying the word of God. I'm, I'm the second word of God in Hebrew and whatever. And God says, hey, I'm packing my stuff, I'm going. Why are you going, God? Hey, you are hating the truth. I don't hate the truth, I'm studying it. Hey, hey, hey. The reflection. The effect. Your reflection. And your code of uh, conduct towards my, your wife. You are transgressing. Don't tell me that you're loving me. You better stand up and go back. Say you're sorry. Because you know what? You are committing the sixth commandment of murdering. Because in this, maybe you've got a good reason why you're irritable with her. You think you've got a good reason. But if you see God in the midst of it, you will deal with your reason why you are irritable differently. All the amens, they just ring in my ears. As I... Sorry? Yes. Yes. Why do we become angry? Because we feel that you've got a certain need and your wife or somebody else or life, as we say, or people do not give you what you feel you have need of. That's you become why you become angry. That's why you murder. You kill the truth inside of you. And you are angry with that person or you are angry in the situation. If why when there is uh, riots, why do people take a placard of a person that, that symbolizes their unhappiness, why do they burn the placard of that person's image and likeness? Because they're actually rejecting him. That's what they are demonstrating. So when somebody kills another man, they might, might not even, not interested in God. But they're actually rebelling against the likeness and image of the king. Therefore, the word says, when you kill somebody, the Lord says, you must be killed. Because in killing or murdering one another and physically doing it is by trying to, uh, what's the word? He will say, uh, what's it now, Afrikaans, Karlu? Say, you mean some likeness? Say, say, Eva Beeld. Say, gelijkenis and Eva Beeld. Is he bezig om dat je dit uitwis, wis je die koning uit. Probeer om uit was. Of misken. Jy kan sê, nee, maar ek brand hier die vlag. Wat gaan nie oor die regering nie? Het gaan nie oor die mens wat in week, my nie stupid is nie. As jy vlag brand, of jy skeer een plakkaat op in die openbaar, of jy doen enig iets wat die, die likeness en image is van dit wat in jy eindelijk rebelleer, dan is jy bezig direct om die lijn persoon te rebelleer. So if you and I are rebelling, Wherever we are, we are rebelling and 
and murdering and killing. Murdering, killing. Hopefully it's this. Murdering and killing. Somebody else. You know, actually, I've got a problem with the one whose image and likeness he's created in. Don't say, no, I'm just burning this flag just because I like burning a flag. Tearing up the image of this person. How do we kill? We kill by killing reputations of people. How do we do that? By gossiping. By speaking lies. We all have experienced when somebody uh, kills your reputation. Because you are your reputation. It's not your reputation standing there and then somebody kills the reputation and doesn't touch you. We all know how it feels. I know how it feels. When a whole church kills your reputation and they tell everything of different things and different stories and all types of ways that they kill you. So the moment we offend a man, our offense is immediately against God. Because here we see, I should do this. I should do this. Now it's actually correct. So do not say, uh, this side I'm okay, this side I'm not so sure. No. The amount that you and I are not following his principles this side, that amount it reflects this side. It brings down your points. If you scored, if you scored five out of five here, and you've scored three out of five here, it brings down your points to three out of five. Your and mine. Right, then we, when we go, uh, look at the second commandment, which is uh, uh, directly linked to the seventh commandment, as I said to you, this is Hebrew. It's not what I think. This is what is taught in Hebrew, that it's reflected, uh, parallel, horizontally. As we said, Jesus said, if you, in your heart only man, pastor, in your heart, if you desire and lust, lust after a, a woman, in your heart, you've committed adultery. And to commit adultery, it means you've actually committed idolatry as well. As I said to you before, in previous studies through the years, that idolatry, can you spell this way? I am the doll. I doll. I am the doll of my life. Okay. So idolatry or adultery, let's say adultery is when a man betrays his wife with another lover. Do you know how many lovers you have? Because what is a lover? A lover is an idea that embraces you and that you embrace, that influences your decisions and your life. We've got one or two young guys here. The big question among young guys, I was in the army, is masturbation. And I've spoken to spiritual leaders 
then. And they could never tell me that it has to do with adultery. Because masturbation you need in your heart and in your imagination to commit adultery and idolatry. Therefore, it is a transgression of the law of God. I've brought this in because spiritual leaders don't talk about it and they don't know about it and they don't want to know about it. Not popular to say. So when you and I embrace our own plans, it means that you are embracing your own lover. That lover is going to control you. Like when a husband has got a secret affair with another woman. Nobody knows about it. Puts on his coat lifts up his collar, puts on a hat, walks like this into a house, and thinks nobody's going to see him. We do the same. You put on your religious hat and everything, because we are in a specific situation, and uh, we dress up ourselves, and we go in with this idea, and we commune and love. In our minds, nobody see it. We commune. And we love this plan that we have, this idea that we have. We even call it God's plan or God's idea. And, or feeling, yes, or feeling. hand op blaas met hy gevoel. Want jy weet nie toelaatbaar is nie. Jy weet hy gevoel, is nie van hier af nie. Maar jy hou vast aan. And then, you come out, into the public as if you have no lover in your secret closet and you think and I think you and I can walk under a blessing but we experience a curse and we say hierdie dinge werk nie vir my nie jylle studeer die woord in detail Ek stel nie daar belang nie. O sister, en meneer, kom ek sê vir jou geheimpie. Ignoreer die leerlinge. Moe nie kom na die leerlinge nie. Moe nie weer daarvan nie. Jy is in elk geval bezig om of teen dit te wandel, of in dit te wandel. Ek kan nie sonder buiten en wegkom daarvan. So, it is, it is dangerous. I remember many years ago after the Lord saved me. The Lord miraculously sent me to an old lady. I didn't know that she was really a prophet. I can say that and I don't say that lightly. And I would say to her, Taniletti, when do I know that I'm following God's plan. He says, pray my son, pray. And after a while we come back to him and I said, when do I know I've prayed enough? He says, pray it through. But he don't dear my kind. Come back here and say, but then when do I know that you have been He says, you shall know. But that you have been dear Pray till the thing has been prayed through. When is it through? You will know when it's through. <laughs> yes. When you've, become to, when you've come to the place of peace, and as my wife has just said, when you've laid down your idol or your plan or your obsession, we get these obsessions and we call them God's obsessions. The kingdom of God is not a bluff. That's why it's put it down here. It reflects in our human relationships. It reflects 
in our relationship with him. Let me just refer you to the scripture, Deuteronomy 11. Should we turn there? Yes, let's turn there. Deuteronomy 11. It's just in reminding, in reminding you and me, I think we had a look at it last week. I think so. I'm not sure. Deuteronomy chapter 11, Deuteronomy 11. Vers 26 tot 32, Deuteronomium 11, vers 26 tot 32. God said to Israel, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. God is speaking to His people. He's not talking to the nations outside of Israel. He's not talking to our neighbors today. He's not talking to your family that may not be serving God. He's talking to you and me. And he says to you, and he says to me, although you are saved, although you are my, my nation, my people, he says to you and me, he puts a blessing and a curse before us. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I commanded you this day. So he says, if you walk in the Spirit, having my relationship with you and with Him, and in that walking in the Spirit and having a relationship with Him, obeying and following the landmarks, embracing the truth, loving the truth. He says in verse 28, And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way, out of the way, direct, out of God's will, which I command you this day, to go after other gods which ye have not known. And it shall come to pass when the Lord thy God hath brought thee in unto the land whither thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim, and the curse upon Mount Ebal, the two mountains. God has literally put them and say, do you see this mountain of blessing and the mountain of curse? Which one do you choose? For ye shall pass over Jordan to go into possess the land which the Lord thy God giveth you, and ye shall possess it and dwell therein. And ye shall, sounds very definite, definite, shall observe to do all the statutes and the judgments which I set before you this day. So I say, Jelle, on ons en ek en jy moet die beginsels van die Heere en sy woord vastle, moet ek volg. Ek weet nie hoekom Christene verbeid het nie, die woord sê. Kom, ek los het vir een ander tijd miskien. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verse 19. He says, I call heaven and earth to recall this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. So die Heere sê, ek kies, ek wil hee, jy moet kies, dis een leven in jou verhoudings, leven in jou huis, leven by jou werk, leven binnen in jou, a blessing in jou, a blessing in jou huis, a blessing in jou verhouding, a blessing, a blessing, of, een vloek. En jy moet kies. As jy kies om nie die beginsels van die woord te volg nie, dan kies jy automatisch dood. En nie die begins, en nie, en nie lewe nie. En andersom.
I've written a few more things here about idolatry. Stubbornness. The word says stubbornness is idolatry. And I wanted to write it this way so that you will and I will remember. Stubbornness is idolatry. And what is stubbornness? The word says, I re I'm going to read it to you. It is witchcraft. You read with me just now in Galatians. Paul speaks to the Christians in the charismatic church in Galatia. He says to them, witchcraft is among you, which is a fruit of the flesh. Because what is witchcraft? Witchcraft is murmuring. Murmur. Speaking softly. Speaking in your heart. Rebellion. Rebelling against the situation that you are in. Rebelling that God is not taking you out of it. Rebelling against the wife that the Lord has given you. Rebelling against the husband the Lord has given you. Rebelling against the circumstance in which you are. You are rebelling. You, you murmur mur so under your pull up. You burn in your heart, murmur here. That is the essence of witchcraft because what that do you create? You create a network that gets hold of you and controls you. It controls you. If you speak under your voice, if you murmur against your boss, I'm not talking about if your boss is not saved. I'm talking about whether your boss is saved or not saved, but you are unhappy with him for some reason. Legitimately or illegitimately, it's irrespective. But if you keep on rebelling and murmuring in your heart, that thing starts to control you. It controls your mind, it controls your being. For nights I laid, I, 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 I laid awake fighting this thing. It's trying to control your mind, trying to control, get hold of your heart because of Christian leaders, people that slept in this house for many, many, many years that came here overseas and slept, and slept with us and we had fellowship together that turned against, turned against you. You can't work out why, how, what is going on, why. The turmoil binds you, binds you up and controls you and that's the only thing you can think of. And you react and act from out of that place of being bewitched. That's why Paul says in Galatians, people started bringing in the Torah or the principles as the law. Saying to him, if you do, people came in at Galatians and they said, if you do this and 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 this, that is what really, uh, serving God is about. No. Not what we are saying. We are saying, if you follow God and you've got a relationship with Him, these are the directors that you and I need to follow. As a result, and from, of, from out of the point of a relationship. So witchcraft is idolatry. 1 Samuel 15, let's just turn to Samuel. One Samuel chapter fifteen. Saul was not long ago appointed as king of Israel, the first king of Israel. And Samuel told him, Saul, before you attack or do anything in this war against the Amalekites and Agag, 
before you do anything, wait for me. I will come, I will pray for you, I will give you the directions, I will give you the plan that God has for this specific battle. And Saul waited and waited. And the Amalekites were coming closer and closer and closer. The situation was, was according to Saul's, what's say sent here? He sent, according to Saul's census, the battle was becoming so close that he needed to do something because God doesn't seem to be doing anything because Samuel wasn't coming. According to Saul, Samuel already should have come and Samuel didn't come. So Paul or Saul says, wait, I'll, I'll do the religious act. We'll follow my plan and the best of what we capture, we keep and we offer it to God. Many years, somebody said to me, please, wasn't here, was in Joburg, we had a big Bible study there. Somebody said to me, please pray, Pastor, please pray for me that I win the lotto. And I promise you, if I win the lotto, I give you the tithe. The best of best. <laughs> All right. So, this is what Paul, Saul says. He says, all right, guys, let's keep out the best for God. They saved Agag and all the fat, uh, fat sheep and, and the cat, good cattle. Keep that aside. And then Samuel came on time. According to Saul, it was completely late. Not on time. After the battle. Saul said, Samuel, I thought you were never becoming, so I made my own plan. I mean, it's a God-given plan. I've sanctified the plan. We call it God's plan, and look, the victory that I gave, so the victory is an indication that it was God's plan. Uh, 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 uh. And now, uh, uh, Samuel said, but I'm hearing a bleating because I told you to destroy babies, mothers, fathers, sons, grandfathers, grandmothers, all the cattle, all the sheep, everything, everything, destroy everything. But I hear a noise of sheep bleating and everything. Oh yes, Samuel, I mean, we're keeping this aside for God. This religion. Samuel says, bring me a sword. Bring me a gag. Chop them up in pieces. Blood was everywhere on the ceiling of the tent, everywhere. How many pints of blood do a human being have? All that pints of blood was everywhere. Samuel was full of blood. He says, all right, that's God's will. Now let me tell you, Saul. And he, answers, he tells him here. Verse 23. For rebellion, he says, 22, Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is uh, iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord and hath also rejected thee from being king. He has rejected thee from being king. So what Saul does, he Christianizes and religionizes his plan and the prophet says, I'm not bluffed by this. You know what God wants? He wants obedience. Disobedience is idolatry and adultery. He says, stubbornness and rebellion, the King James says, is as witchcraft. The Hebrew says, Rebellion, stubbornness, is witchcraft. Not as, it is witchcraft. How many times have you experienced, when my wife and I, when we are rebelling, rebelling because we are in a certain situation, or a child has said something to us, or circumstances has happened in a certain way, or our needs has not been met, or whatever, and we talk among ourselves, and we agree, 
and we agree and we agree and we agree later on it's a curse you experience the curse soon after that and the only way the curse is broken is I would come to her or she to me and say the way we've been speaking the way we've been rebelling is not right it is not right the only way is let's go down and repent and ask God ask God to forgive us and that thing usually and many times do not just leave you immediately because your mind has been set now in a specific way now after repentance you need to reverse and change the wheels the 16 wheels as the Hebrew talks about the 16 wheels inside of us our minds need to be reversed and changed and channeled into a different direction God's direction I'm way over time I'm a little bit over time can I just go on for another 50 minutes <laughs> no not 50 minutes I'm just joking right just to complete this we are we are busy talking here about oh this is a big 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 thing in the Christian world let's go to Deuteronomy 24 Deuteronomy 24 verse 16 Deuteronomy 24 verse 16 all right before we sorry don't uh, before you read that I'm sorry i um, keep your place there I should have read first Exodus chapter 20 um, the second commandment here sorry come on let's not eerst Exodus of 20 Vers 3, 4 en 5 en 6 tot bij 6 Thou shalt have no other gods before me Thou shalt make unto thee uh, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or freemasonry or whatever Islam materialism communism And so on and so on, on. Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to, their, uh, to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity. And we're going to read about this now. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. You see, it's about hatred. Idolatry and adultery is about hating him. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Right. Then we say, but our father, my father, my great-grandfather, my great-great-great-great-grandfather was an idolater. He served so and so and so, and he was a Freemasonry, and he did that, and he did that, and he had giraffes, wooden giraffes in his house and he had a, a what do call well, there's so many weird things that you hear they had this and that and that and my great grandfather cursed God I hear him curse God and, and so on and so on and now I am the victim of all of this here I am poor me I'm under this curse verse 16 of Deuteronomy verse 24 says the father's shall not be put to death for the children neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers every man shall be put to death for his own sin right let's go to Ezekiel chapter 18 because there are many many doctrines ministries based on Exodus chapter two, uh, 20, verse 3 to 6. Ezekiel chapter 18, 
Want baie keer voel u en ek, man die kees is wat ek maak, en die foute wat ek maak is omdat ek eindelijk onder die vloek van my pa, of my ma, of my opa, of my oma, my oma, my oma, my grandmother, red people's teacups. My grandmother and my mother visited witches. Oh yes, she wasn't a witch, she was called Madame Rose. Madame Rose. My ma- Madame Rose saw things. Zij was met die helm geboren. Zij sien goed. En nou is ek ook onder dit. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 19. Yet say ye, why? Doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that, ha- that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should t- return from his ways and live? But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not become a mention in his trespass that he hath trespassed and in his sin that he hath sinned. In them shall he die. This is a terrible scripture. How many times Christians think they've built up enough credit because they've served God for so many years. I've been serving God more than 40 years since I got wonderfully born again. More than 40 years. Have I got a credit that I can work on? No. The question is, John Hendricks, are you serving God today? Or do you think you can glide and slide on your credit that you have? No. Yes. Verse 26, when a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and, and dieth in them for his iniquity that he hath done, shall he die. And you can continue to read that whole scripture. Therefore I have asked many Christians, are you born again? Are you saved? Yes. All right, I'm not talking about 15 years ago. Today, are you serving God today? Are you choosing His truth today? Because in 1 John chapter 2, we've read, He says, if you keep His commandments, then you do know that you know Him. So it's measurable. So He wasn't talking about a feeling that you have, or uh, I don't, I don't, I'm a spirit man. I walk in the spirit. I don't like the word. The, lo- the word brings death. Rubbish. That's your own gospel. You need the spirit and the word. Jesus said, you need yut and you need sayen. You need the spirit and the word. You cannot separate the two. You cannot say you walk in the Spirit, but you do not study in the Word in detail and follow the Word. It's impossible. It's like a train without a, a, a railway. Without a railway track. You haven't got a train if you haven't got a railway track. And a railway track, our land, is full, our country is full of them, but there's no trains. All right, we're talking about the 10 principles of life. 
and how it implies to my life. We're talking about the faith, five basic pillars of man's duty towards God. God's relation, man's relationship with God. We're talking about the five important principles that will bless human relationships. If you and I have them in mind and constantly use them as landmarks in our day-to-day -day walk, because, yes, we do transgress the law consistently, continuously. Therefore, we have a Messiah, a Deliverer, Yeshua Moshiach, deliver us, to deliver us from our sin. But how would we know sin without the commandments? How would we have known covetousness if the Bible didn't teach us about what is covetousness about? And gave it a specific name. How would we have known what is murder if the Bible didn't speci specify it and explain to us what murder is about? How would we have known sin without the law? When the law comes and when the law came, sin revived. Because suddenly now we see I'm a transgressor. I need the Savior. What we've been explaining is all the time I was referring you back to Yeshua, Moshiach, Jesus Christ. All the time. Because yes, all of us sit here and say, I have transgressed. I transgress continuously. I, I cannot obey all of this. But this is to give an indication on the way how the road runs to the king's throne. Amen. Let's close our eyes. Lord Yeshua, Jesus Christ, you are you are our way. To the Father. You are our Redeemer. You do not excuse sin. You've paid for it. You've paid for every time that we have transgressed your law. You've paid and given us a way, a living way a way of joy, a way of freedom. And you've given us your commandments and your law with a complete different meaning to it. You haven't given us rules to obey, but you've given us principles, codes of living, in our relationship with you. We thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you have spoken to us today through your spirit and through your word. We want to embrace you. We want to embrace you by your feet and say, Lord, I realize today how much I need you. Thank you for your blood. Thank you that your blood covers all my transgression of the commandments and the law. And I agree with your word that I need you. I'm a sinner saved by your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen.